Jay, and now I you're said taking that... offense at the slightest thing I said because I disagree Jay? with your tactic. You have to deal with objective reality. For All right, life. Jay. Uh, when you start out as an outsider like me, you start out with a giant obstacle to overcome. This is the most irrelevant debate of all time. Um, well, I would love to move on. No, you made Jay. him the force, the face of the movement. No, I did. look. Oh, oh, Brianna, you, you, you got it. So I'm the driving force behind challenge the establishment, okay? Oh my goodness gracious. And then Jamie gracious. starts joking around about looking up my co-host's skirt and how cool it was and how funny it was. They would have all started saying, well, how, look at her, thinking she can do this. What an I mean, arrogant of course, person. Of course, Jinx, but we all we all know that, right? Please, all of us, the best of your abilities, let's get beyond it. Let's go back to unifying and let's try to do something productive that's right. That's 100% right. I'm so glad to have on Bad Faith for the first time, Jank Uger, who, of course, you all know is the founder of the Young Turks, probably the most successful and most watched left media outlet on the internet. Welcome to Bad Faith. Uh, thank you, Rihanna. I appreciate it. Uh, and uh, it's good to be on here. Now, Jank, we, you know, you're, I introduced you as, you know, a founder of Young Turks, but you're also recently ending a presidential bid. I regret that we didn't talk to you while it was still ongoing. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about it now and get your perspective on who the remaining left candidates are and how you think the left should be looking at how to use their vote going forward from this place. But let's start with your own campaign. Obviously, I think the kind of high top top end news item that people were focusing on was your eligibility having not been born in the United States of America. Do you think that subsumed too much of the coverage and kind of undermined an ability to run a sort of a message campaign? A hundred percent. But there's also a giant irony in it, uh, which mm. is that it, it kind of consumed, subsumed the campaign to the point where we had uh, much more trouble raising money, getting in the media, all the things that we needed to run a real campaign, right? Uh, but at the same time, we didn't get any credit for doing something interesting and pursuing a civil rights matter. So we didn't get any like coverage from it either. Mm -hmm. So it wound up being a worst of all world. Because I think that if I was in a slightly different situation, let's say that I was Jennifer Granholm, so someone who was a secretary cabinet and very respected, born in Canada, et cetera, and I decided to run for president. My guess is that that, hey, first naturalized citizen to run for president would have, if it was someone that had status, privilege, position, would have been taken so much more seriously. Like, it would have been considered like, wow, that's a beautiful, great, amazing thing that this person is doing, whereas I got... Yeah, he he he's not qualif uh, eligible, so we hate him twice as much. Slash will completely ignore him, and so it was just became impossible to recover from that. And you know, many other things happened in the campaign, and I think a lot of positive things happened. But in terms of ability to succeed on some of the core issues, that really hurt us beyond our ability to recover. Yeah, I mean, that feels right. And I understand why that's frustrating. I completely agree with you that the kind of civil rights case that you were making is an important one. I think many people who've listened to this podcast have hopped in the, to the comments on Patreon or, el or elsewhere and said after a Shama Sawant interview, for instance, oh, gosh, I wish she could be president. And there are a lot, a lot of folks over the years, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger on the right, people were desperate for him to be able to run for president, who for various reasons, you know, sparked the imagination, compelled people to start to try to investigate whether or not this was possible. But I think you're right. When you're already running kind of an insurgent outsider campaign, something like uh, eligibility requirement is going to potentially have the effect of derailing the effort entirely and preventing people from looking to you with the amount of seriousness that's required to get off the ground in the first place, which I would say is not just an issue with your campaign. It does seem to be something that's causing a lot of these left efforts to flag. And I would, I would, I think, pivot to what's going on with the Cornell West campaign, where it does feel like the pivots between launching with the Movement for a People's Party, then going to the Green Party, and then going independent, I think caused some folks who were pretty ready to get on board to have some hesitation about whether or not they wanted to throw their own money behind that project. What's your read? 
Yeah, so it's a good lap, uh, overlap between the nationalized citizen issue and the, the left overall and, and our chances. So um, I, the second thing I would have said about the nationalized citizen issue is that if I was running on the Republican side, then I think that mm -hmm. I could have been a Democratic hero, ironically. Like, if you How's run that? as a Democrat, they hate you. But if you if I ran as a Republican challenging Trump and saying the same exact things that I was saying about Trump, but I was on the Republican side and pursuing a civil rights case exactly as I was, I think mainstream media would have looked very kindly on that. That would have been like, whoa, okay. And then a lot of civil rights groups would have probably rallied to my cause. But what you don't see, and hence now the overlap in the two subjects, is how much power the Democratic Party has and how censorious they are and how punitive they are. So that's behind the scenes that only a few people like myself, Marianne Williamson, Cornell West, et cetera, have seen it. And so, for example, I would book events uh, ranging from small things like a speech at Bennington College of Vermont or Texas Tech because I was on the ballot in Vermont and Texas, and they would get canceled a couple of days before the event. And, mm -hmm. and it happened in every instance, in every situation that you could imagine. So I got booked on CNN, canceled. Booked on uh, Jesse Waters, mm -hmm. Fox News Channel, canceled. Uh, Vermont Progressive Caucus, canceled. Arab American Museum in Dearborn, Michigan, canceled. Mm -hmm. And so if you're wondering, why are these all getting canceled? That's because you've never run against the Democratic incumbent. Uh, and they have tremendous power behind the scenes because it's not just that they call the Arab American Museum or Bennington College and say, drop them. It's not Joe Biden on the phone. Of course not, right? Mm -hmm. But it is A, a group think that anyone running against Biden is a heretic of the most extreme variety and must be punished and must never get a voice. The most important thing is do not let them out of the box, okay? And I think that Marianne suffered this more than any of the candidates, yeah, uh, right. including myself. And so that's point one. Point two is, this is another one that's very uncomfortable for people, but important for you to know, a lot of Democratic politicians huff and puff and look like they're challenging Biden, but behind the scenes, they're not challenging Biden at all. In fact, they're trying to help him. And so, for example, and this is another topic we can get into, the uncommitted delegates, because they did win delegates, mm -hmm. go to Joe Biden. So that's not an accident. That's actually on purpose. How how is that possible? My understanding was that, you know, there's all this is discussion partly spurred by Ezra Klein's piece from a couple of weeks ago about whether or not there's going to be a convention fight. And my understanding was that those delegates in the context of those fights would have to be won by whoever emerges as Biden's heir apparent. Yeah. So uh, my understanding right now is that since uncommitted is a word, uh, which honestly was like, I get some of the strategy behind it, but at a minimum after Michigan, they should have pivoted and pivoted hard uh, because as things stand now, since it's just a word, it goes to whoever the candidate is. And that's the leading candidate is Joe Biden. It definitely does not go to anyone else. Definitely. And no one has no one has leverage over it. No one had, can control it. Who can raise their hand and go, I am uncommitted? I mean, you, Rashida yeah. Tlaib can't do it. Nobody can do it. It's not a thing. So, so, and I have heard from allies in the Arab and Muslim American community, et cetera, that I was a bridge too far. That even though I, I would argue, I could argue, and I think probably a lot of people, even the haters of mine, would probably agree, I don't know that there was anyone defending Palestinians with the kind of fervor that I was in American media, let alone international media. Now, but at the same time, they thought I'm a bridge too far and it could hurt their careers in the Democratic Party. If well, they what do you mean me. by that? What do you think it was about you that might cause them to believe you were a bridge too far in your words? Easy. I, I, I don't kiss Joe Biden's ass. And I know I don't mean that in like some like, oh, that but do you think that Marianne and Cornell West? I mean, I, I know that some of my listeners are going to say yes. No, no, I no, think no. That I mean, we're all... West too. But I mean, comparatively, there are other folks in the mix who have been critical of Joe Biden. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm glad you're asking for the clarification. No, they they are uh, equally a bridge too far. They they're not 
it's the same exact phenomenon for Marianne and Cornell, et cetera. So uh, it's not like, oh, I'm, you know, more of a British Stuart than they are. It's just that if sure. you're actually saying things that are not complimentary of Joe Biden, and in fact, you could see it with your own eyes. When Dean Phillips, a U.S. congressman, got in the race, there was grumblings. But in the beginning, he was saying very complimentary things about Joe Biden. So he was invited on CNN many, many, many times, and he was still an, an acceptable figure. The minute he started criticizing Joe Biden more aggressively after we were all banned from the Florida primary ballot, then he became persona mm -hmm. non grata. And then he became a radical, and poor Dean Phillips has lost his mind, and you can't support Dean Phillips, otherwise you're betraying the Democratic Party. And, I mean, you can go back and read the articles pre and post, and you will see an enormous difference. And we saw that day to day. So I think I think there's something to that, but I'm really interested in getting back to the core of this, just what seems to be a strategic consideration around uncommitted, which is whether or not they should have pivoted to a person. Because this is, of, of course, is something that I think has crossed a lot of our minds. When we see the numbers that uncommitted is will, a, able to put up, compared to the numbers that other left candidates have been able to put up, or, you know, people who are not uh, participating in the primary uh, yet, obviously, like Cornell West. But, you know, I think many of us wonder why why is it that uncommitted can get 100,000 votes in Michigan or get 30 percent of the vote in Hawaii, get into the teens in what was it, North Carolina, when these left candidates have struggled so mightily? And was there any effort to try to link up, assuming yeah. that you're a candidate who's ideologically aligned on Palestine, which... You know, maybe you were, you know, Marianne has had her criticisms uh, with respect to her stance on Gaza, although, of course, she does support a ceasefire. Um, I don't know what the limits of the uncommitted sort of argument are. But was there any effort between you or, to your knowledge, uh, Marianne or any other campaign to try to say, well, we should we should just rally behind a person as opposed to a word? Yeah, 100 uh, percent. I did um, and I called all the Muslim leaders I could think of and reached out to them. And uh, they had a lot of positive words. Keep going, brother. We love you, brother. You're doing really important work, brother. And no. Uh, so. So what, but what did they say to you? Like, what is, is it? Is it to say, well, as every every candidate does, there's some baggage that we don't want to be, uh, uh, you know, connected with. Or is there a policy point that we don't want to entangle ourselves with? What was it? Yeah, so it's a combination of factors. So uh, number one, when you run as an outsider, again, me, Marianne, and even of all people, Dean Phillips, uh, the sure, minute he started yeah. criticizing Joe Biden, um, you become persona non grata in a way that is that goes way beyond the establishment. It actually seeps into even your own allies and the progressive movement. Why? Because mainstream media smears you so thoroughly that people don't know it's not true and they can't get it out of their heads. So, for example, one of the th concerns that the uh, Muslim community had, and these are all small, they're not determinative. It's a collection of things, okay, mm -hmm. was, hey, is Cenk sufficiently pro-Muslim? And you would think like, well, that's the most insane question I've ever heard. Um, I'm born Muslim. My whole family's Muslim. Uh, no one defends Muslim Americans or Muslims across the world in American media, arguably more than me. Or if they do, it's a tie, right? So why would they even question that? Because they read from the New York Times the last time I ran for Congress that I was anti-Muslim. The New York Times just stated it as it was a fact and never clarified that I am why, actually born Muslim. Why would, the, why would they write that? They wrote it because... Uh, once an outsider runs, a smear factory begins. So that particular smear came from... But of all the ways to smear you, I would expect... I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to awfulize here, but I would expect the, the usual slight that Muslims get is that they are anti-Semitic, for instance. It's something that a lot of us who've been defending Palestine on the left have been hit with. It seems bizarre to go out of your way to accuse a Muslim person of being. I mean, I don't know. I have been accused of being anti-black, <laughs> so I don't know why I'm yeah, so no, surprised. No. So, Brianna, I can explain all that because I lived it. Sure. And so, um, at the time, if you remember, I'm running in 2020, and Bernie endorses me. The minute mm -hmm. that Bernie endorsed me, and it was right before Super Tuesday, so it was at a mm -hmm. critical time. 
that they're trying to take down Bernie Sanders by mm-hmm. any means necessary. I remember. So, so when he endorses me, they do a quick and dirty check of all of the dirty talking points against me. And then they put it up without double checking at all, let alone maybe sometimes actively on purpose doing it. So I can say that with confidence because the New York Times had to re- retract parts of their article mm-hmm. about me because other journalists were shocked at the at the level of lying. And, and it's, not, it's not exaggeration. They had to retract it. It's on the record. One of the things that they did, Brianna, speaking of anti-Semitic, is I had invited David Duke on to see in 2015, why is Trump so popular and why are extremists like David Duke backing him so much? And and he wound up going, I thought he was going to go on anti-Muslim, anti-Latino, anti-immigrant. No, he went purely anti-Semitic rant for about an hour mm-hmm. straight. And I called him anti-Semitic, bigoted, racist, idiot, et cetera, et cetera, because you know my style, right? And so mm-hmm. the New York Times said that I agreed with David Duke. I had David Duke on, and I agreed that he was not racist. And people that watched the video, they were like, <laughs> what? No, guys, yeah. this is this is a, this is is a crazy. What? So are you guys trying to smear this guy on purpose? Because no one could watch that interview and think that I was supporting David Duke. Like, so then when you look back, so where did they get that anti-Muslim part? By the way, they threw an anti-Semitic too, because why not throw that? throw the kitchen sink at me so that Bernie gets smeared by association, right? Mm -hmm. So they got it from a rando joke from, I think, 11 years ago or something. And I stand by that joke 200%. And I included Muslims in that joke because I wanted to say, hey, look, I'm not making fun of other people's religion. I'm also including mine. And I was it was a joke about how God is, is he really going to pick based on a fashion show? Right. Like Muslims dress in a certain way. Orthodox Jews dress in a certain way. And is God going to be like, well, I like the big Russian hat. I'm going to go with that brother. But the rest of you dress wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Like, not a joke. Not he's born Muslim. He is fully and has a long history of being anti-Muslim and anti-Semitic. Okay, so the New York Times, I know for a fact, is a bunch of liars and they lie on purpose. So or they don't or they're the world's worst journalist. And they're like, who cares if it's a joke? Who cares if he said the opposite? Who cares if he's Muslim? Our job is to smear outsiders like him and most importantly, Bernie Sanders. So that's how those things come about. But the worst part of it, sorry, Brianna, one last thing. The worst part of it is that good people believe it. And how are they supposed to know? How are they supposed to know? If I read that New York Times piece when I ran for office, I would have voted against me. Because it, it painted me as a right winger who hated all these groups that I love and fight for. And if you don't know the reality, of course you're going to not like me. So that gets into people's heads. So that's a small part of it. There are other parts, too. So I have the article in front of me, and you're right. Uh, it's by Jennifer Medina, and she opens it. Can an endorsement be put back into the bottle on Thursday? Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont endorsed Jank Uger, a progressive talk show host running for a California congressional seat who has a history of making offensive comments about women, Jews, Muslims, and other groups. So I want to ask you this question as a follow-up. Do you regret that Bernie endorsement? Do you think it caused more trouble than it was worth? Well, yes and no. Uh, I yes, as in, if I thought it was going to hurt Bernie 1%, I wouldn't have wanted it under any circumstance. And you could argue that it did uh, hurt him a little bit because it provided an opportunity, fairly or unfairly, to smear them one more time before Super Tuesday. So uh, with the benefit of hindsight, knowing what happened, I I would have never asked for it in the first place. And you know that that's true because the minute we ran into into this trouble, I called Bernie and said, brother, you got to take it back. You got to do whatever you can to get the hell out of this because they're trying to smear you and your campaign is infinitely more important than mine. Yeah, I, I do remember that really vividly. I want to come back to the um, uncommitted uh, discussion for a little bit. So do you think that fundamentally there was not a single name that the community would have, the the uncommitted organizers would have embraced? Do you think it was just any name was bad? Or is there a possibility that someone like, say, Rashida Tlaib, who obviously has deep ties in her own district, in her community, in Michigan, where this whole thing seems to have started and be based, and 
could be, you know, as the current rules are without the civil rights claim that you were making, president as is qualifies in all the ways you got to qualify. Is there a world where you think that they would have accepted Rashida Tlaib's name on the ballot? Yes. So, but she's the only one or almost mm. only. Okay. So, mm -hmm. and let me explain why. So one, you've got the spheres that people accidentally believe. Number two, I had the problem of the fact that, you know, I'm a naturalized citizen and a, a lot of people thought, uh, is there's no point there, right? So why bother mm -hmm. uh, voting Investing. for this guy that can't, mm -hmm. it, that might not be eligible, right? But I, my point back to them was, yes, but I'm also positive that uncommitted, the word is also not eligible to be president. So like you lose absolutely nothing by backing me. I could actually gain delegates and then use those delegates, unlike uncommitted, as leverage to try to end the bombing of Gaza. How confident are you about that, by the way? How 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 sure are you? Because this feels pretty untested. You know, what information do you have about how whether or not you actually were, uh, were able to have get those delegates and delegate them, as it were, at a convention? Yeah. yeah so if Joe Biden is the candidate and he never withdraws, and, and I was absolutely clear with all my supporters about this, then those delegates are worthless. He is going to have 98 percent of the delegates. The two percent aren't going to matter at all. But if Joe Biden withdraws from the primary, as, as Klein suggested in that podcast, and I think there's some percent of chance that he's going to do that, then the delegates become worth their weight in gold because presumably the Newsoms and the Pritzkers and the Whitmers have to try to get as many delegates as possible. And they're competing with each other. Then you have that as a batch of delegates that is leverage that could be used to try to extract some sort of significant promise from them, like any mm -hmm. of the Bobby and Gaza. So that was the uh, idea. And there's plenty and there's very good logic behind it. There's no question about that. So, and then the, but lastly, and most importantly, out of all those factors, is that the if the Democratic Party will end your career if you say mean things about their candidates, their incumbents, the people that are already in power, or even if you support someone who says negative things about their candidate or their incumbent, then that is the third rail. So everyone who was both either a politician or a leader in any kind of group that has to deal with the Democratic Party, then realizes, no, don't, mm -hmm. that's third rail. Do not support anyone who criticizes Biden, because that'll be the end of you. And hence- so Let me ask you- Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. And hence, it became a, per a situation where attaching a name to that uncommitted cause became untenable, honestly, and I'm sorry, I hate to say this, and I don't want to cause division. I'm just being honest with you guys. Because the leadership did not want to risk angering Biden more. Now, I said the only exception would be Rashida Tlaib because she's right. already among the elites. She's already has enough credibility as a United States representative that people would go, oh, OK, well, if it's Rashida, yes, 100 percent, then we're willing to take that chance. And by the way, that would be the voters. And she has enough amplifier on her own right that if all she did was say it, a lot of the voters would have gone in that direction anyway. And I think that she has enough clout that she could have pulled at least half of the other leaders in that group to join her and maybe all of them. But yes, some of them would have been risking their careers. I mean, so that's an incredible proposition that I think is going to cause the ears to prick up of a lot of people listening, because even outside of the horrors of Gaza, a lot of the left that has become disenchanted with members of the squad over the years have held uh, Rashida Tlaib in high esteem. She has never been on the bad side of the worst of these votes. She sat out uh, when others decided to vote for the to break the uh, um, the railroad uh, strike. She doesn't seem to have been participating in the rotating villain around the Iron Dome and some of these other hard votes that progressives have intermittently taken bad votes on. She is the one that is, for lack of a better word, the most pure and unsullied among the squad. And so that combined with her incredible advocacy around Gaza, I think she's the dream candidate of a lot of people, which raises some questions about, you know, and I don't expect you to have, um, you know, telepathic insight into what's going on with her. But like, given the kind of historic nature of this moment with Gaza and the dwindling opportunities that the left is being presented with, why not? 
what a missed opportunity. Why not? Yeah. So look, um, first of all, let's be fair to Rashida. I, I, mm -hmm. I never talked to her personally. And so I'm not saying she's one of these politicians who uh, thought criticizing Biden was a bridge too far. I want to be super clear about that. Yeah. I'm not saying that. Uh, I do know that there were other such politicians. OK. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and furthermore, we have no idea what's in Rashida's head and what she's heard about me. It's possible that she heard a crazy lie about me and thinks it's real. So to be fair to her, you know, who knows in this crazy looking glass world of mainstream media where gaslighting is so industrialized that it's we're like all like the fish when they ask, you know, how's the water? What water? So I don't know what's in our head, but I do know that she didn't return, you know, the the outreach that I had. And so again, that might be for what she thinks is perfectly legitimate reasons. Number two, I have no right for someone to get back to me, right? That's not a thing. If they if they're busy, they choose to do something else, no problem. That's not my business, that's their business. Okay. Now, having said that, yeah, as a human being who's personally affected by this and and sees all the inner workings, it's hard not to get frustrated. I would get least frustrated with Rashida because she has been pure. It's not an act. She has been great on all those things, right? So, but at the same time, if I saw someone working this hard to help any cause that I believed in, I'd reach out. I mean, and Brianna, you know me, like I reach out to people all sometimes to a fault, right? I bring people in, I bring people in, and then some people then turn around and do things against me, and I still don't get jaded. I still bring more people in, right? So, but but not everybody thinks that way. But it's not about Rashida. It's about the ideas behind these movements, right? The principles and the what drives people and what incentivizes people. And what All is right. hard for the average person to see is the assumptions that the people in charge have. And the, and the incentives and disincentives they have, because a lot of the top Democratic donors that fund those politicians also fund a lot of the groups. So if you dare to cross Democratic politicians, your money is in jeopardy and your organization is in jeopardy. Right. But and just to be clear, Jake, I wasn't asking, you know, regardless of her relationship with you, what I'm asking about is whether or not she would be interested in running with committed, you know. And so I'm more curious about whether Committed reached out and was interested in that kind of a project rather than, you know, because as you said, we can't mind reading about your guys' relationship. Rashida running yes. for president? Yes. Yeah, my guess is that she would have thought it was too unrealistic and and that that could hurt yeah. her Wh reputation. Which, which is a shame. And I hope I would love to get her on the show, Rashida, if you're listening to this. Um, we'd love to talk to you about it because I, I know for a fact that the kind of support that other progressives have been struggling to recapture post Bernie because of the disappointment with Bernie and people's unwillingness to open their wallets back up. I think he would be pleasantly surprised by the grassroots campaign that's eager to materialize at your feet if you ever show any interest there. Um, yeah. But, but Rihanna, I, let me I just wanna... say one quick thing about that. Sure. So you're absolutely right. You would, there would be a groundswell for her that she does not anticipate. And that is why I tried so hard to get other progressives in this race before it seemed that almost no one would get in. And hence, I got in to try to push Biden out. But you're right, because I know, like, when you start out as an outsider like me, you start out with a giant obstacle to overcome. And, and so Rashida would not have had as large an obstacle. But in order to be fair to Rashida, you have to understand that she would have run into that third rail too, and they would have smeared the hell out of her. It wouldn't have just been as bad as it is today. They would have all started saying, well, how, look at her, thinking she can do this. What an I mean, arrogant of person. Oh, of course, Jane, but we all we all know that, right? And so this is a, a little bit of a difference that you and I have had for some time over some of these political issues. I think the left has to accept that obviously it's going to get smeared, no matter what it does. And therefore, I think that should frankly not be a part of the calculation unless the left just wants to sit on its hands and be like, we're going to just exist and do it and live with whatever the neoliberals 
want, we can both shut down our shows and stop talking about it all. Because if we're going to say we're going to freak out if there's any resistance to us, well, then we might as well not try. There's going to be resistance. And this was, I really don't want to go down down this road. This was a little bit of the argument that was being made by some folks around, you know, force the vote, that the squad is going to be smeared. And I think some of us were saying, yes. Obviously, and it's going to be on us to do what we can with independent media to protect them and rally around them and to push back. But this is a kind of a once in a generational moment where they have real leverage. Will they use it? And now similarly with Rashida Tlaib, it's like, OK, is this uncommitted campaign demonstrating is is the is the hor- horrific nature of what everyone's seeing on their phones in Gaza enough to galvanize a real grassroots campaign around a candidate like Rashida Tlaib? And yes, the likelihood of her winning almost nothing. But we seem to see already that the uncommitted campaign has pressured uh, Biden to at very least do a rhetorical shift and start saying he's in support of a ceasefire. It's obviously nothing and it's rhetorical and it's not enough and it's bullshit, but it's it's a demonstration that they're listening and that there's leverage to be had. We see this weird rigmarole over this port that they're building off the coast of Gaza. Again, it's bullshit and it's nothing, but it's clear evidence that the Biden campaign is trying to come up with busy work to make it look like they're responsive to the significant slice of the electorate that is saying, we won't vote for you as long as you're the henchman to a genocide. Um, so I did want yeah. to ask you this this oh, argument oh, about, oh, go ahead, go ahead, you can respond yeah. to that. Yeah, you're bringing up something really important, Brianna, and, and I need to be clear. No, we don't disagree. We don't disagree at all. The only part we disagree on is when and where, like tactics, not strategy. And I, I think I proved that pretty spectacularly by running myself. So do I believe that they should have the courage to defy the establishment? Of course, that's why I set up Justice Democrats. That's been the the driving force behind Young Turks, TYT, the entire time. In our mission statement, it has the phrase, challenge the establishment. And when no one else would do it this time around, I did it knowing that I was going to get obliterated. Not just that I was going to lose... Very, very likely. Obviously, I thought I had some narrow window to be able to execute something nearly miraculous. But but I knew that I was going to get attacked and ridiculed and be treated with disdain. But my I said, if I'm asking the candidates to do it, I've got to be able to do it myself and to take that kind of abuse. But in my experience, people that already have some degree of power, it is near impossible to convince them to sacrifice themselves. They but that's just the problem, will isn't it? not do it. Isn't that the problem, Jenk? I mean, some of us, like, so, you know, obviously you and Kyle did Justice Democrats together and Kyle has come on the show and made this exact case as to why he wanted the squad members to stick their necks out, neck out and be willing to fail. Saying exactly what you've just said, that the whole point of getting them elected in the first place was to have some folks in there that were willing to take a dive on principle. And AOC, of course, is, who has been quoted a million times as saying, I'd rather be a one-term congressman than to not live up to my principles. I'm paraphrasing, but we all, we all yeah. know the quote. Maybe we can splice it in again. What the Bronx and Queens needs is Medicare for all. We can do it now. It takes political courage. Start bringing the ruckus on the Democratic Party. That is our job. It's great that everyone thinks these issues are important. We need to make them urgent. This country has only ever changed for the better by groups of people that were willing to put everything on the line for a better future. That's how we got the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement. That's how we got the labor movement, queer rights and marriage equality. It didn't happen by people playing it safe. We have to give it all we got. Don't people realize that the most powerful position you can be in is when you are not materially attached to a position of power? If you're a one-term Congress member, so what? You can make 10 years worth of change in one term if you're not afraid. The Democratic Party does not do more unless it is pushed. So we need to push them. Um, And they don't like it. I think I annoy them, but <laughs> in that, but, um, but that is our job. That's our job. Um, so that is what is so frustrating. I think not that th- there's an, un, uh, a failure to acknowledge the risks that they face, but 
you know, as I'm sure you understand, the people who listen to this show and other shows like yours and who were sending $7 checks or $27 checks to the Bernie Sanders campaign, many of them did not have that much money to spare, but were willing to do it because they said, here's a fighter who's willing to sacrifice it all for me. I'll sacrifice it for him. He's going to sacrifice it for me. Yeah. And so then when you have people who can barely make rent sending you checks, boosting your campaign, knocking doors for you, and you're sitting there unwilling to let go of $175,000 a year salary, when you also have a million and one opportunities that frankly are better paid if you were to leave Congress at this point, if you're an AOC or member of the squad, when you're able to access book deals or you could sit as a co-host of The View or you could join the Center of American Progress or whatever or venal opportunities Democrats offer you once you leave Congress. You know, the argument that, oh my gosh, I could lose my seat, it starts to it, fall on deaf ear, deaf ears. Yeah, go no, ahead. No, Brianna, I'm I'm just telling you the reality. I totally agree with you. I, I think that it's it's unacceptable that they're not. I, I think, and I think that they've actually done things worse than what you're saying. So let me explain the difference in the tactics where we had. I don't want without fully getting into it. Just real quickly, I thought that uh, putting all of our leverage in the speaker vote was so premature, and that it was not the right tactic. But when it came to later things where their vote mattered the most on Build Back Better and especially on the Inflation Reduction Act, where they could have they had enough of a voting block that they could have made all the difference. And that is when they should have built up their power and leverage and used it and used it. And I was tearing my hair out on Young Turks. You got to use your power. This like if you you had it. In my opinion, they had a perfectly good reason not to do the speaker thing. It was too big of an ask for too little in return. But if you don't use it when it, it when the whole enchilada is on the line, okay, that just means you didn't have the courage to use it, and you're never going to use it. And and then this whole enterprise was a mistake. And so and and now not only do did they not use it then when it was critical, but since then, other than Rashida fighting. Uh, valiantly on on Gaza, and and to be fair, the rest of the squad supporting her on Gaza. So I appreciate them for that. I appreciate them for a couple of other things to varying degrees. I mean, I do, I do wonder what you make of ASC not sitting with them and wearing a kafia and holding those signs up at the State of the Union. Yeah, but to some degree, etc. But what I was getting to, Brianna, is but overall, no, I've kind of given up on them. Uh, I've uh, and so. But, uh, but Shank, so I, I hear you, right? Like, in everything, in hindsight is twenty twenty. But let, let's play this out a little bit, because obviously we're years later. We've seen the Republicans do this exercise, this exen identical plan, and do it over the Speaker vote, and to do it multiple times, right? The second yep. time actually ousting the Speaker. The, the, the argument that it's about what the ask was, it feels a little frustrating, I think, to some of us, because me personally... I love the idea of Medicare for All being part of the ask, and I certainly am not going to deny that I'm very committed and was very committed to Medicare for All being part of the ask precisely because we were in the middle of a global pandemic. There was no vaccine out. People were dying. People were terrified. 15 million people had just lost their health insurance, right? And it felt like a prime moment to be foregrounding Medicare for All at a time where Bernie had just lost. And it, it kind of felt like we weren't going to be able to have this conversation again perhaps for a generation. And that feels kind of like where we are right now because certainly nobody's talking about it. No, so Brianna, but you're reward, flipping wait, it. Wait, 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 let me just finish this. Let me finish this, yeah. Cenk. So I, I will admit, I'm not trying to run away from my desire for Medicare for All to be part of the ask. But at no point, and I can't speak for anybody but myself, but at no point was, to me, the ask limited in those ways. So I'm not a, I'm not a Hill expert. I don't, I'm not a, I don't know exactly what's in the province of what Nancy Pelosi can provide in her capacity as a speaker versus the kind of thing that will require broader congressional buy-in. But I do look to others like David Sirota for advice. And when I was writing the piece for Current Affairs, making the case for Force the Vote, and David Sirota reached out to me, we were kind of talking about it because he was a little bit on the other side of the issue, but we talked about it. And he was writing a competing article at the time for, I forget, The Nation maybe? And I said, well, let me just link to yours because I think all of your asks, his argument was that the asks were too small or, or, or wrong. I said, I love your ask. I'm going to link to your article and incorporate them into mine because I think we should ask for the moon and the stars because they have real leverage here. Let's talk about it. I don't care what it is, but something should be demanded, right? Because I hear your point that save your political capital for later. 
But it's not as though they're going to oust them between January 4th, the vote in March or whenever it was that they first voted on the American Rescue Plan, right? There was no risk at them not being able to have another bite of the apple. And if anything, you can make the argument that having proved their willingness to pull the trigger in January, they would be taken more seriously over the fight over taking 15 out of the American Rescue Plan or whatever it was that you wanted them to fight for. So I, I wonder what you say to that. Yeah. So you said you're not a Hill expert. Unfortunately, I am a little bit. And here's what I mean by that. Um, I, I've talked to a lot of these Congress people behind the scenes many, many times. And the number one disconnect between us on the outside and them on the inside is the culture. And you cannot underestimate this or understate it. Once they get into Washington, they are surrounded by everything in the world is gaslighting. And they are told that if you are against your Democratic colleagues, you are a moron, you know nothing, you're embarrassing. I don't doubt that. Okay, hold on, I don't hold doubt on, that at all. Hold on, hold on. So, and all those things. And then I try to tell them, no, guys, you're getting gaslit. And there's an excellent example of that, and that's related to this story. So when you guys were asking for Medicare for All, I knew at that point, based on what I was hearing, that Medicare for All wasn't ever going to be proposed under any Biden administration ever. So asking that in the context of D.C. would have made you look crazy. Now, you're not crazy. You're not at all crazy. We should be going towards there. But that's how it would have been perceived. So they viewed it as like, oh, my God, they, these guys have lost their mind. Whereas if you asked for $15 minimum wage, what I was getting back at that time from them was, Jake, you're crazy because that's already passed. That's we're positive. Nancy Pelosi gave us a rock solid promise that it's going to pass the Senate. And I told them, guys, it's not. You're naive. And then they got super mad at me because I was trying to do something that was doable. You could actually do $15 minimum wage if that's where you did your stand. But you have to take a stand at some point. You can't take it at every point, but you have to take it at some point. And you could have taken it on $15 minimum wage. You could have taken it on Build Back Better. You could have taken it on Inflation Reduction Act. And we could debate till the cows come home when was the right time and the right way to ask that. But we know the, the main thing that you and I agree on is they never made the ask. So right. that means and, and Cenk, I gotta it was say, a failure. Cenk, many of us predicted this. Right. It, some of us didn't require hindsight. Some of us saw the writing on the wall. And so I want to just correct a couple of things. One, the ask wasn't for Medicare for all. No one was laboring under the delusion that they were going to take a vote and it was going to successfully return a majority for Medicare for all. Joe Biden, by the like way, that. had already said that he would veto a Medicare for all bill if it had ha passed the House and the Senate. And there's no reason to disbelieve him when he tells the truth. Since he, <laughs> I mean, he is lying by and lying Biden, but he usually lies in the more uh, venal conservative direction, not a progressive one, right? So the question was whether or not we should have a certain kind of a political conversation by having a vote, um, uh, having the ability to have a hearing on Medicare for All. That was the ask, to have a hearing for Medicare for All, the likes of which hadn't happened for, I think, two years. And even then, it wasn't technically a hearing on Medicare for All. It was phrased to have a more limited scope. And it was only the odd progressive here and there that were, that were pushing Medicare for All as a more specific issue. So that, that was the question, just to have use your opportunity to have a national conversation in the middle of a pandemic about Medicare for All. I appreciate if you don't think that's a, specific, a particularly large goal or worthwhile goal, but it is a goal that many of us were deeply committed to and did think was worthwhile, in addition to any number of other goals, including getting Richie Neal off the Ways and Means Committee, getting rid of PAYGO, any number of other things, including getting up-down bills, um, clean, voting on clean bills, which is something that the, the conservatives, the Freedom Caucus, managed to get out of their negotiations with um, uh, Kevin McCarthy, and a bunch of other kind of procedural reforms that I think are frankly more democratic. But then I want to follow up on something that you said. Are, many of us had suspicions that the kind of strict, I mean, let me, um, the kind of forceful pushback that came from some parts of the left media over this, like we're having a very reasonable conversation. People can agree to disagree and we're, this is fine. But as you remember, I'm sure it got very intense. And it seemed to be from some of us who had less access to talking to squad members and seemed to be, for me, you know, I just started this podcast. I was very attenuated from any of that, that 
and, and, and Sam Cedar alluded to this when he was on Bad Faith back in the day, that it almost seemed like because of conversations you had had with them, where they had said they were under these pressures that you described from the rest of Democrats, they had asked you to turn the temperature down and no, that you were responding to something, some specific conversation. So can you clarify, yeah. were, were you ever asked to, to drop force the vote? 100% no, no way. Because look, honestly, we're taking our tell ourselves too seriously. Once they get inside the walls, they forget about us completely. Like I was barely hanging on to conversations. Like they were, they didn't care enough to ask me to help to turn down the temperature. And I'll tell you exactly what happened. If we had left it at, hey guys, I think that tactic is a little misplaced right now because your ask is too large and you're uh, and you're asking at the wrong time without building up leverage, et cetera. And me, I thought that, Sirota thought that, uh, I think Ryan Grimm thought that. If we left it there, beautiful, who cares? We're all honest actors trying to get to the right answer and we disagreed about a tactic. But you know what happened next. Then a certain person called all of us uh, not only liars and not only like deceptive, but that we were secretly working with Nancy Pelosi and the CIA. So it became personal, it became toxic. And then people said, well, why don't you work with a guy who's a lunatic and thinks that no, you're no, taking no, money from the, the CIA? No, no, but it was the attacks on the squad. It was, the, it was, it was, it was, it was Jimmy Dore's attacks on the squad that got a lot of pushback, which I didn't understand. Because what you're describing, Jenk, I think and it's really legitimate. And I can really explain legitimate. exactly why, too. But, but, but let, me, let me pinpoint this into a question so we don't like, kind of spiral out a little bit. I, I completely appreciate personal attacks were made and that's uh, all, all around and that's not appropriate. I don't have any interest in retreading that. But specifically, like at the time, I remember thinking, well, I don't know. Maybe the squad is right. Maybe they have a different kind of um, they're saving political capital for something that I don't understand. And let's let it play out a little bit before I completely say fraud squad, they're useless. Now, I think in retrospect, fraud squad was an apt. <laughs> I mean, I don't I don't you know, I, I have a different kind of a vibe, but I think it's a pretty apt um, description, descriptor. And what you were describing just then, Jank, when you were saying you know, they're un under all these pressures. They're told by their um, Democratic Party cohort that if they betray Nancy Pelosi, if they betray the party, that they're worse, they're worse than scum. They're the bottom of the barrel. They'll never have friends in Congress again. I believe that. And I believe what you are saying when you describe that. But I think there's a difference of opinion on what to take away from that. And I think, it's, we'll call it my side of the left, says your job, I know it was hard, but you were sent there by people like you and in, in Justice Democrats, by by you, Jank and Kyle and Justice Democrats. You were sent there to do exactly that hard work. And if you weren't up for it, I'm not behind you anymore. Yeah, but Brianna, you, uh, and that's where I am. But Brianna, you got to know when to play that card. If you play it immediately, then you you ask for something unreasonable and you lost your leverage with with them and you should and I get how do you gonna, lose your leverage? Hold on, hold on, Brianna. Okay. Hold on. I, remember, I'm on not only am I on your side, I'm the guy who created the group. I'm the and my the That's driving, what was so confusing. That's what right. was so frustrating, I think. Yeah. So I'm the driving force behind challenge the establishment. We didn't send you to have a tea party with them. And the thing I get most frustrated by is. You were supposed to open the door behind you. So when they started hesitating out of the gate about endorsing primaries against incumbents, I remember thinking, uh-oh, we got a significant problem here. Because this was supposed to be a movement. This wasn't supposed to be an ego exercise for a couple of people. Because if you get comfortable, then it was just about your ego. Your job was to open the door. So... Sister, there's no one on planet Earth that agrees more with that because I'm the one who came up with that plan. So the debate we were having is when do you put them to the test? So let's when talk about do you that do part. It? Oh, And so then you get them back into tactics. Hey, I think it was right to do it in the beginning. It was right to ask for maximum. Oh, it wasn't maximum. Whatever. Those are tactical decisions. But for me, when it became the tipping point and absolutely clear that they were never going to head in the right direction was when Pramila Jayapal did the trust Biden campaign. And that was, yes. it was literally called that. And you could watch me uh, bring Ro Khanna on and ripping into him on, on the air. But, but, but look, bro, you didn't, that. but you got it. Look, you could just, let's just do one thing at a time. You guys yeah. said that you would not vote uh, in the House until the Senate passed Build Back Better. 
you're now saying no, we withdraw our position. You have to say that's true, because it is true, right? Well, there was a disagreement. There were different opinions, but certainly our chair, Pamela Jayapal, said uh, initially, I don't know how she framed it, that we want some ironclad. I can, I can read a New York Times quote yeah. for you. Progressive Democrats warned the House leadership that a majority of their members, a majority of their members will withhold their support for one trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill until the Senate passes a second far larger package containing their spending priorities. That's a fact. So yeah, but if yeah, the challenge is if we really were to to hold to that, then yeah. uh, you we'd have nothing. I mean, you'd, you you really would then the president's agenda would not happen and we'd move on to the no, next No, no, but I hold mean, on, Representative Khanna, that's of course not true, right? So you wouldn't have it yet. That's not true. Hold on, you wouldn't have it yet. And then what would happen next is pressure would then go back to Mansion and Cinema and they would say, "Well, the progressives are holding the line." And they're doing the same exact thing that Mansion and Cinema are doing. Mansion and Cinema are drawing red lines all over you guys. And and Ro, yes. I give him a lot of credit because he's the only one that actually withstands that and comes back and is honest about it. Yeah, but he's going to be I on would, this week. <laughs> yeah, but I said, Ro, what are you guys doing? If you don't act right now, that means you're giving away all of your leverage. And this is your only chance. There is no tomorrow, right? And they couldn't. Find, I'm going to be honest. They couldn't find the courage to do it, and they and they were selfish. At that point, we're all in the same camp, and so I would argue yeah. back, Brianna. Well, then weren't people wrong to call us CIA collaborators and make up lunatic conspiracy theories about us? I'm not interested. I wasn't ever a part of any of that. I can't. I don't remember that. But I I trust you. I'm not trying to invalidate your recollection of it. But I I stay out of that. I don't deal with. I don't do that. I stay out of that. But 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 I want to I want to get to this core point this, about this this strategic argument, and then we can leave a, move away from this because I know my audience is like Jesus Christ, Brianna. Even we are tired of talking about forced to vote yeah. at this point. Yeah. This question of losing your leverage fundamentally, I think a lot of us saw at the forced to vote moment that absent some argument that AOC was going to be literally ejected from Congress, and that the squad members not just to focus on her, but the squad members are going to be literally somehow between um, f January and March when the reconciliation bills were being voted on, was going to no longer exist. Then the possibility of losing your leverage is not there because the leverage comes from what the margins in the House are. The leverage came from the fact that just like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, Democrats literally could not pass anything either without them or without Republican complicity. And to me, that's a win-win. Either you get a bunch of Republicans on board voting for Nancy Pelosi, and then they have to defend that in their districts, or you get a bunch of, if it's a, on a given issue um, down the line with, with respect to the reconciliation, so if you get a bunch of Republicans crossing the line to help Joe Biden, and then great, that's something that they can be attacked on later on. Or you actually get what you want the way that Republican Freedom House caucus members were able to extract and con are continuing to be able to extract meaningful concessions out of a Republican party that frankly, overwhelmingly does not agree with them. Most of the Republicans are establishment Republicans who love the same old things from the neocon era, but somehow this little group of misfits have managed to punch way outside their weight class. And all we're saying is tactically, we think we're right because the tactical considerations, the leverage could not actually have been torn away from the squad members because the leverage lay in the distribution of the house. And what we knew was that was only gonna last two years. And we, we also knew that the only bites of the apple we were going to have were these two reconciliation cuts. And so it was now or never. And that was that was our uh, um, but you, you tactical were wrong. consideration. But you were wrong. How it wasn't now or never. <laughs> uh, so, but it literally but, was. And even in retrospect, Brianna, you don't think I they should have gone for wasn't. it? No, but you have to okay. admit we'll, we'll have to agree you have disagree. To deal with, you have to deal with objective reality. So look, uh, for I hope for the right, last Jenk, time, for God's the sake. The audience can weigh in on whether they think what I described or what you have described as objective reality. Okay, the objective me, reality me, is that those margins existed for two years and now they're out of power and they can't do squat and they never tried and now they never will, right? Okay, the, the inability to, to discern tactics is maddening. Okay, so let, well, let's- Well, that's an odd ad hominem attack, Jenk. So it, it if, you wanna, if you wanna be critical okay. of other people for attacking people's intellect or their reasoning skills or things like that, then I think that we should hold ourselves to the same standards. We disagree, and we're talking about our disagreement. You don't have to okay. accuse me of having an inability, as frankly, someone who's very well trained and having analytical, good analytical skills, of having a technical, being technically and unable to 
assess the technical the the tactical situation here. Okay, right? so let me try to address all these things as quickly as I can because this is the most irrelevant debate of all time. Um, well, I would love to move on, but hold on. So let me explain my position because again, you put out things that are okay. So all, Brianna, all I pointed Brianna, out was on. that the, the margins just... in the house don't change, Jenk. That's the only thing I added to this conversation. The margins in the house don't change. Okay, Do you disagree Brianna. with that? No, Brianna, can I just answer it for God's sake? So Please. number one, number one, on the personal stuff, you said it just a minute ago that you didn't care that somebody was claming we're a CIA operative. It's no, not that I didn't care. You didn't but care. That I didn't do but you it. Didn't and that's care. Not... And in fact, well, I, I, you piled on. But you Jake, said what you I actually were said is I'm not aware right. of that. The lunatics were right. You said the no, lunatics were... were right. I said, so you want to get said... personal? I can get personal no, on it. Jake, and now you're taking that... offense at the slightest thing I said because I disagree Jake, with your tactics. I said but I'm not that supposed the pro... to offense that a lunatic is saying I'm backed by the CIA when I'm the guy who set up the group to challenge the establishment. So you're allowed to take a massive personal offense at the slightest thing that I just said, but I'm not allowed to take any offense at a massively lunatic position that you largely supported throughout. Okay. So okay, Jane, what I I'm said was force the vote. Put the personal stuff aside. Jane, and get I, back what to I said, Jane, what I said was that force the vote was right, and I said I was not aware of any accusations. I think people have an outsized sense of what people are paying attention to. I don't know about any accusations of CIA. I've never Jimmy heard Dorr that in my life. Unhinged accusations. You didn't I, know I, that? I gotta tell you, Jank, that specific one I've never heard. I've heard him make fun of Ryan Grimm's toupee. I heard him make arguments in favor of force the vote. And if you jog my memory, there's probably some other personal attacks. I remember they all decided to, you guys started to all go back and forth about who was the biggest sexist because of things that happened in the past. I stayed out of that. I don't care. I don't care. And I think it's for both of your benefit that I didn't weigh in on any of that because there was some well, wrongdoing all around as far as I'm concerned. But that wasn't my concern and it continues not to be my concern. I don't want to get into that dirty muck. I want to talk about the strategic considerations behind force the vote. That's it. So I think the strategy that was articulated by Jimmy Dore was right. The strategy, yes. Yeah, this, okay. Now this, now get back, back to strategy versus tactics. You said, hey, their leverage is maximum in those two years. And yes. the vote count is in those two years. Yes. That's what I told you. That's what I, of course I agree with that. After the two years is over, it's totally irrelevant. So the question we were discussing, Brianna, is when within those two years do you use it? And you guys said, use it right away, use it all. Now, what I know from Washington is, as much as it frustrates all of us, and it makes me want to tear my hair out because they wasted years of my life, I knew that if you ask for the maximum thing, they're going to think that you are not credible. And then once they think you're not credible, and yes, that's super frustrating, guys. You think I'm not frustrated by it? Those guys that I helped to get elected telling me I'm not credible because I'm asking them to do their job? I know, but that's why you had to hold for a moment where it was important. So for example, Pago. Pago would have been a perfectly good moment, even though it was early on. $15 minimum wage, what a perfectly good movement. And you cannot wait past the Inflation Reduction Act because there's nothing past the Inflation Reduction Act. So our entire debate is between the speaker vote and the Inflation Reduction Act vote. When, when, Because we agree on the strategy. When would have been the best time to use the tactic of drawing the line and saying, guys, this is what we sent you for. If you don't do this, then we're going to have issues. And the downside of going too early was and going the way that Jimmy did, and I hate to bring it back to him, I never want to talk to him about it, talk about him again. But unfortunately, he was the face of the movement at the time, and you have to be realistic about that. And he gave, and and Brianna, if you don't think so, you're in a bubble in the outside. No, it's not world, that, that I don't think so, but Jenk, you Jimmy made Dorr. him the. No, you made okay. him the force, the face of the movement. No, I look, oh, Brianna, you, you're you guys, nuts. Okay, but I don't. I don't I don't want to go down this road, but like I want to I swear to tell you, like as I got to say last thing, one, I got to say one last thing. Wait, wait so a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Let person, me finish Jane, Look, seriously, I just want to I want I want you to hear me just like as a human being. I I remember I like I was very new to this space, media space. Bad, bad faith had existed for like three months or something like that. I am someone who had a lot of appreciation and respect for the institution you've been able to put together for what. Sam Cedar has been able to put together. I adored uh, Michael Brooks and loved going on his show. He was the first leftist to ever have me on. I considered so many people who are on the other side of that issue to be 
friends and people I really cared for, Emma Viglin, Nomi Kantz. Like these are people who were very early in my trajectory, moving from the law to the left. And I thought we could just chat. And I, there was this one event that Jimmy Dore hosted. He has the biggest live stream of us all. So of course, why wouldn't he host it? But uh, Katie Halper spoke at it. Crystal Ball spoke at it. Um, Cornell West spoke at it. Chris Hedges spoke at it. And I spoke at it, right? And we interviewed Medicare for All activists and people who had lost loved ones and people with various disabilities and people who were suffering from COVID and all sorts of things. And so, yeah, if you want to say it was like Jimmy Doris because he hosted the live stream and because he was the biggest channel of us all, I mean, that's obviously true. He he was so much, big, he continues to be so much bigger than me. But also in a world where you wanted to vet these issues, like I invited Sam Cedar on, we invited him on the show and we had a conversation about it that I felt at the time was very constructive. And that could have been done with Crystal or anybody else who I think gave a really measured, un impersonal, mature, responsible articulation of what the goals were. And I just am saying that like going forward, if an issue like this happens again, I hope you're able to reach out to me or Crystal, whoever it is that's on the side of a given issue, just have them on your show to talk it out. Because there was a lot of misinformation. Sam Cedar was still arguing that somehow the Republican could become Speaker of the House. There was a lot of arguments that were circulating at the time that were just wrong and that were just kind of misstatements of the position. And I think we could have had more of this kind of a conversation, civil and respectful and reasonable, and come to understand each other's positions a lot easier if we had just been willing to reach out to each other and talk before slinging around ad hominems. And I blame Jimmy as well for slinging around ad hominems. No, it's not as well. That's what drives me crazy. So, it, it, Brianna, can you again promise me in return that the next time an ally of yours is, is smeared as thoroughly by a, a deranged lunatic as we were and almost everyone else that disagreed, had an honest disagreement about tactics? He also said Amy Goodman might be working for the CIA. So when you have a deranged lunatic on your side, maybe you realize, hey, this guy's smearing everyone and yes, turning they, allies they, into they, enemies. I, I don't hold want on, to do this. Hold on, I'm your, asking your allies you. were telling me, me that I was dancing you. on the grave of my dead friend. Your allies were smearing me all over the place too, but I don't. I just muted everybody and moved on. I didn't hold you okay, responsible for anything like, else anybody else said. I like... muted everybody and moved on. So Brianna, I, I'm never going to concede that it was 50-50. I don't. If I, I, said, I didn't say it was 50 50. No, but you, I, everything you say makes it sound like, oh, you and Jimmy. Well, I don't were mean to do that. No, I'm not no, qualifying no. at all. Okay. Oh, my goodness. And then gracious. Jimmy starts joking around about looking up my co host's skirt and how cool it was and how funny it was. And all of a sudden, no one cares about sexual harassment. And every time we're supposed to be like, well, and then we get yelled at. Why don't you just accept that you guys work with CIA? Why don't you just accept? that you should be sexually harassed and that the left loves it now. And then we're okay. the bad guys for not accepting that massive, massive I, insult. I don't know who said that. I'm sorry if someone said that to you. I, I was not a part of that, so I can't speak to that. So the only thing I care about is to make the following point. You're making an Between... outrageous ask, uh, Brianna, because if someone uh, said to me, hey, some, like for example, Jimmy said about AOC, we should go to her house and make her feel afraid. If I, I would, at the minute he said that, I was done with him forever and ever and ever. Look, that's a because, difference of opinion. I, no, I think that's that not a difference Chris, of opinion. What okay, that does is okay. it makes our it, whole side toxic. It's quite Super literally a difference toxic. of opinion. It hurts our but, cause so okay. much. How can what you he was not talking about? I remember, that it hurts our cause I, to have people associated with of us that are radicals, I, that are like almost calling for violence. I, are you they weren't, but he wasn't calling for violence, Shank. He was doing what Chris Hedges, who I presume, is he on the bad list as well? Chris Hedges talks about no, the I politics don't. of fear. When people protest outside of elected officials' houses, of course, the, the argument that I would make, and I'm sure the argument that Jimmy Dore is making, is not that we should have machetes and try to chop them into pieces when they walk out the door. No. Oh, thank God. The argument is that having a pressure campaign, the same way that Joe Biden, God bless, cannot go anywhere right now without being... Um, protested by pro-Palestine protesters is causing him to be fearful about his re-election ch chances. That's 100% what should be done. And I give kudos up the wazoo to the protesters who are keeping that pressure on. So that's that's the argument. But again, I don't care about any of that. All I want to make is, all I care about is the following, that the leverage that existed on in January of 2021 would have existed, continued to exist in March of 2021. And as angry as people would have been with the squad over force the vote, 
absolutely nothing precluded them for withholding their vote again over a $15 minimum wage. But what we got instead was that they neither did it in January or March. So I, I just don't see how in retrospect you can be making that argument that somehow they were not going to be able to withhold their vote meaningfully over a $15 minimum wage in March. There was no political capital to titrate down. The exact same political capital exists for the two years that the margins in the House were what they were, and they should have used it at every opportunity. That's the okay. argument. There's nothing wrong with that tactical disagreement. I really don't agree. But I think that what ended it for us and completely, it not, they weren't going to do it. Look, let's just be real. So 90% of it was decided by the fact that they got comfortable and they were never going to do it. But 10% mm -hmm. of it was once Jimmy started saying those things, it made the grassroots non-credible. So it gave him an easy excuse. It gave the AOCs of the world an excuse to ignore all of us and say, oh, it turns out these guys are crazy now. They're threatening violence. They're like MAGA. So now I could feel at peace about ignoring my own voters because they're led by lunatics. And so maybe the DC people were right. Maybe we should just trust Biden. And so you got like that, that forced the vote lost the the strategic people inside the movement, a lot of leverage. And then we had no leverage at all. And we were goners. And so, but don't worry, like, don't, I, I don't want people to focus on that because it's a small thing. They wouldn't have done it anyway, I don't think. Right. Well, that's, so that I think to... is the main point. And I'll say this, you said earlier, like, I mean, just now the question of whether or not our influence is gone. I'll tell you this, a squad member reached out to me in the spring of that year, I don't remember exactly when it was, but within a few months of force the vote, literally scheduled to have a phone call with me because they wanted to know what was next. They were literally were like, okay, well, we didn't want to do force the vote because the what was told to me was that they found the rhetoric toward AOC to be personally offensive. It oh. wasn't a strategic, but wait a minute, but wait a minute, Jenk, to me, this is an indictment of them. They it's didn't say that they, just, wait, but wait a minute. They didn't say that they disagreed strategically. They were so they were more concerned about vibes and feelings than a strategic opportunity. But now this congressman wanted to know from me, congressperson wanted to know from me, what's next? And yeah. I said, there's nothing next, Congress member, because but you squandered you this opportunity. That? Why did you say that? You should have asked for something. You there was nothing to around. ask for, Jenk. There's nothing. To, first of all, I'm a podcaster. I'm not sitting around. I don't. The genius of Force the Vote was that it was an amazing idea. It was such a good idea that I heard about it from Sam Cedar, who validated that Jimmy Dore, a mortal enemy, had a good idea. I was watching Sam Cedar show. I didn't watch Jimmy Dore. I was watching Major, Majority Report. And no, I heard, no, wow. No, no, this no. Brianna, look, so when, when I, remember, Jimmy was not a mortal enemy in the beginning of this. He called me about force the vote. And I said, mm -hmm. I generally, Jake. wait a <laughs> That's minute. That's not true. That's not no, true. No, 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 even, no. even in the Sam Cedar segment that I was watching, he kind of made a little, I'm not saying it was as bad as it is now, obviously, but he made a little joke about how, like, obviously I don't like, you know, Jimmy Dore and the dumb, dumb left. But even, even I have to admit, this is a good idea. It, it was built into the segment I watched. Brianna, and that was why just, I went over to Jimmy Dore to hear more about it. Cause I was like, if this Brianna, guy's validating it, Brianna, it must be something. You're just factually incorrect. No, Sam we can go back. We'll see if we can go and try to pull right, that video. We, uh, go back and no, no, no. I you're remember missing it Brianna. vividly. Please listen. Please listen. Sam Cedar has always hated Jimmy Dore. When yeah, they were that's, both. That's what I'm saying. God, will you, for God's sake, listen for a second. What I'm telling you is when they were both in the TYT network, I liked both of them. I had a perfectly good relationship with both of them. Sam Cedar hated Jimmy Dore and would constantly attack Jimmy Dore. And I would try to get Sam to stop attacking Jimmy. At this point, when Force the Vote begins, at that point, I don't have any bad feelings. I didn't know that he had done the thing that he did to Anna. I, I didn't know that. So I had no bad feelings. So J Jimmy calls me and says, hey, do you want to do this Force the Vote thing? I go, hey, strategically, I think that that is the right path. I'm not sure about the tactics yet, Jimmy. And so let's keep talking about it. And in fact, you can go back and find videos of him saying, oh, Jenk agreed with me in the beginning. Jenk agreed with me. Yeah, that's right. Because I, as I've explained here for over an hour, I I not only agree with that strategy, I was executing that strategy, but not this that specific tactic. But when we said, hey, I don't agree with this tactic, that's when Jimmy went rogue and started smearing everyone who didn't agree and went and made it a toxic cesspool. 
So that, and so Brianna, when they reached out to you and said, what's next? What happened was after we were done with force to vote, I was a, a relevant issue came up $15 minimum wage. That's where no, we this was after that. This was gone. This was okay. after that. There was no nothing problem. left. No problem. No problem. So let's say that, that that also passed. But when I asked for help there, everybody was like, no, we're mad at you. Jimmy's our boss. And he says, we're all mad at you. So we're not helping out $15. Wait a minute. I thought we were a movement. Well, you're not helping out $15 minimum wage. What is wrong with you? I don't mean you. I mean, generically. And then, okay, fine. We're past that. But Brianna, everybody then went like, I'm taking my ball and going home. No, brother, we got a two year window. That's not what we did. I don't know what was happening in in your world. That's what I did. That's what I did. But everybody else left when their feelings were hurt. I don't know what was going on in your world, but that is absolutely not what's happening in my world. Nobody took their ball and went home. And we all forcefully pressured and talked about to the best of our ability, the squad's failure to push on $15 minimum wage, Pramila Jayapal whipping the votes against them doing exactly that. And we covered it ad nauseum on this show and every other show on this side of the left that I remember. And while I got to say, Jenk, You talked earlier in the podcast about reaching out and extending olive branches. I hope that that's true. And I hope I see that going forward. But you and I had our conversation on your show because I reached out to you and invited you on my show. And you declined, but said I could come on yours. And I did. And I'm glad we had that conversation. But I have not felt the ability. I have not felt olive branches reached out to me. And I have not felt the ability to reach out to other people. It was me that invited Sam Cedar in the wake of Force the Vote onto this show to have a conversation. And I have Brianna, I, I if you admit, wanna, if you want to get into that level of personal grievance, let no, me No, it's not personal grievance. It's it I'm is. really actually trying to bear the bury the hatchet. I'm gonna say that I think it's constructive. I, I hate, can I just be honest? I hate that there are all these people who are in my own community that I don't talk to anymore. That I don't I can't have this guest on my show who I see making funny, informative, smart content, but I feel like can never bury the hatchet over something that was a tactical disagreement that turned into saying some of the ugliest things. Again, I don't want to talk about the reasons I'm offended, but let's suffice it to say that I was grievously offended by some of the very personal things that were said at the time. But I just want to say for the record right now, I would be more than happy to bury the hatchet going forward. I think, and this is what I wanted to ask you about. I'm happy to keep going if you have time, but if not, we can end it here. But going forward, as we're trying to reconstitute the left in 2024 and get behind a candidate in the general election, what are we going to do? Because there are a number of candidates that are fracturing left attention right now. And I don't want this to be a situation where we have a fragmented left that disempowers our ability, especially with Gaza happening, disempowers our ability to put real pressure on the Democratic Party to stop a genocide. Yeah. So look, definitely is my answer. Now, let me give you the context. So at TYT, I have platformed literally hundreds of progressives, both candidates and hosts. We've started, what, half of the hosts that exist now in the progressive ecosystem at some point were at TYT and Young Turks. So, and and I kept going, and I'm still going to this day. We have dozens of hosts. Even though I know for a fact that a whole bunch of them will at some point turn on us and say outrageous and toxic and totally false things about us. But I still keep going and I still keep reaching out. And I'm on this show and I went on and I had you on our show and I keep reaching out and reaching out and reaching out. And then every I mean, once I, in a while. I, 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 I instigated that, Jank. I, 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 I reached saying, out like, to you. you. You're saying, hey, wait a minute. You, I asked but, you to but, be on I a podcast. It's... And and so your hundreds of progressives that you have platformed and helped and launched into the world don't count because you didn't go I, on I the podcast in exactly the right that. way that I wanted. No, I, it's quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. I think that the reason that I try to stay out of the personal stuff is because I think that what you do is enormously valuable. I think that what Sam Cedar does is enormously valuable. Those are huge platforms with smart people who share my politics, 99%, who are advancing my politics. And I would prefer not to say or do anything that diminishes their ability to do good work. Quite the opposite of what you're saying, in fact. Well, look, uh, there's, look, I would last two things that I, I got to go and do the Young Turks. Look, Brianna, in my opinion, when a f- friend and an ally is attacked in a vicious and false way, and people can see this on tape, 
I get their back. This whole blogs and things that got me uh, smeared by the mainstream media started when I backed Sam Cedar when the alt-right attacked him on some nonsense joke he did uh, pretending that he was a groomer, etc. You see me defending progressives all the time when they are attacked because I've been through it a hundred times. When someone doesn't not so attack and he did it, I, I forget if he did it to Sirota first or Ryan Grimm first or whoever he did it. I was like, oh my God. And I went and rushed in for help. When you don't come and help, and when you say, I'm indifferent to it, I don't really care what he calls you. I'm going to call it whatever it is, okay? I'm asking you, going forward, can you just pause for us? And not you, just all, just you, but the whole movement. Can we all just pause for a second and go, wait, is it right? for one of our own to attack someone in the movement with no basis in fact, in a way that is so maniacal that of course they're gonna have, like, are we supposed to go, are we supposed to be dogs and go, oh yes, sir, of course we are backed by CIA, sir, of course, but we will work with you nonetheless, sir. I mean, that is the most unbelievable ass. And so I'm asking you to think about it if it was you. I mean, look, we, I had you on a podcast and you caught feelings that I you did. I didn't go on your podcast. That is so tiny no, compared I, to what we were called. No, Jane. And, and I I don't say it as like a. <laughs> That's not like, the point. No, no, Brianna. I'm not saying it to say ha ha to you. I'm saying it because I'm trying to evoke some degree of empathy from you guys. Do you not see that if somebody goes like you sense like two percent of it and you were worried about it? Imagine if you got the whole thing because some lunatic starts saying that. You're secretly being paid by Nancy Pelosi. And then everybody goes, yeah, well, work with that. Brianna, it's your fault. Work with that person. Work with that person. It's your fault. You're starting to split the movement. You'd be like, what are you guys talking about? That's crazy. Why isn't anybody helping me? Why are they supporting this lunatic instead? But I can't get you to see that. And I don't think I'm ever going to get you to see that. Well, so I'm Jake, done with I, it. I don't want to go tit for tat. And I can sit here and, and pull up all the old tweets of the mean-spirited, very personal. I spent most of February in my one my studio apartment sobbing by myself. I didn't have a network. I didn't have TYT. Ryan Grimm was one of my closest fr friends and allies in this situation. He gave me my first job. I, I to see him as a mentor. And I felt like I couldn't even talk to him about it because things got so toxic. Like I, I, I can't, I, I can't, I, I don't want, I can't appeal to you by, by with my humanity. So I don't, and I don't want to frankly go back there. It was one of the darkest times of my life, to be honest. I was so fucking depressed. Is the people surrounding him enabling him when he puts out ridiculous conspiracy theories, like calling me someone who's being funded by NATO because I interviewed Madeleine Albright once. So a uh, direct question to both Katie Halper and Brianna uh, Joy Gray. Do you guys think that I'm paid by NATO? And if you don't, why don't you say something? Do you think that uh, Sam Cedar is just a corporate shill? And if you don't think he is, then why don't you say so? I just think that this effort yeah. has been so destructive, so toxic, and so yeah. disgusting. And don't tell me not to focus on Jimmy Dore when they've decided to put Jimmy Dore front and center in this entire thing. Go back and look at what I look like on the videos of January of 2021. I look not great. And so all, suffice it to say that I could sit here and tell you all of the deeply hurtful comments that people in your orbit have made. But I truly have no interest in asking you to apologize for Nomiki Konst or Anna Kasparian or any of them. I don't care. They are all, oh, I'm responsible for their actions. You're responsible for yours. And frankly, I'm willing to bury the hatchet on it all. But you yeah. seem to no, no, have a I'm, different requirement I, of me. Rihanna, you want me. Let, 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 let me tell you this, Jank. I, I have no interest in throwing Jimmy Dora under the bus or casting aspersions or one way or the other. But I want to make clear, I have talked on the phone with him, I think, once, maybe twice in my entire life. And it was around um, organizing the Medicare for All rally that was held in January of 2021 in Washington, D.C., talking through logistics of how to put that together. I have had no other relationship with him other than what you see in public on Twitter. I've maybe DM'd him a couple of times. Hey, did you see this clip? What do you go? You know, those kinds of things, including back during the campaign when, frankly, he got really mad at me at some point about something. I can't even remember of what. Of course. He always but this idea really that, everybody for over everything. But, but the idea, but who cares? People have feelings and people get sentiment. Like, I, 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 we're different. I, I appreciate that. But Jenk, you were just screaming at me at the Hill like a month ago and I decided to brush it off. I don't care. 
Like you called me a bunch of names on the hill. We'll slice, splice that in too. But I'm just trying to encourage you to maybe have a little bit of a duck water roll off kind of attitude to some of this and stop requiring that everybody kind of fight your battles or we'd all be mad at each other. Half of my audience wants me to hate David Sirota. I don't want to. I like David Sirota and I think he is intelligent and valuable in this space. Same with Ryan Grimm. And it's okay. They can wish I had a different attitude to them. I can wish they had a different attitude to them, but they can still like me and I can still like them. And that's okay, right? Why can't that be okay? So A, definitely. B, uh, look, if you think David's, like, I'm not saying you, uh, obviously, you just said you're good with them. If you think of David's, Sirota, so I will tell people in your audience so they can get mad at me all over again. If you think David Sirota and Ryan Grimm are not intelligent people that are very, very helpful to the progressive movement, you have no earthly idea what you're talking about. Well, they, Those don't, are the two they don't doubt best their intelligence. Reporters that we have, they're the two most honest, smartest, strongest people we have. So they don't doubt their intelligence, Shank. What they did, what they criticize, because people are allowed to make narrow criticisms of folks that have also positive attributes. What they criticize is to, to the extent uh, them to the extent that they, in their reporting perhaps is too credulous of the incentives of squad members and gives them too much benefit of the doubt and in effect constructively, whether or not it's their intent, runs cover for the squad as they do things like, as we, we agree on, fail to use their leverage at any point during that small margin 2021-2022 term to advance the values and goals of the left, okay. right? Can't, so, that, can't that be no, a thing? But, the, but again, that's super unfair to them. Because they they did exactly the right thing. They thought it was the wrong tactic to use in the beginning. And then when it came time to use the tactic, they were 100% right. And they did put that pressure on. So well, look, they I were... talked to Ryan about it. I talked to Ryan about it on this show. And he conceded. And people can read it, hear his own words for themselves. I don't mean to mischaracterize him. You can go back and listen to that episode from the summer of 2021. But he conceded some pretty important points about the strategic considerations that were being made at the time and the arguments that he was making at the time, some of which were not accurate. Okay. I'll leave it at Look, that. If you, if you are so hopelessly radicalized that you think Sirota, Grimm, and me are sellouts, then no one will ever be anywhere near pure enough for you. And I don't mean you, right. Brianna, again. I mean, but you're just, you're just that. bringing up language that is not really in, in this, but that's okay. okay. All right. Um, all right. That's okay. So look, look, in, I, terms look I, future, Jake, I, in terms of the future, in terms of the future, yeah, guys, I will work with anyone that has good faith and is headed in the right direction. And I don't expect anything. I, I've, <laughs> I've been through everything in the world. I've had mainstream media, as we said in the beginning, smear me beyond recognition i've had now some portions of the left smear me beyond recognition i've had the right wing smear me beyond recognition when i have asked for people to rally sometimes they have in beautiful ways like when we started just democrats and other times they haven't for personal reasons or non-personal reasons or because they heard something that's okay bygones be bygones i don't work with toxic people outside of that everybody's fair game Brianna, you're you're not toxic. I get it. We can't get past that one tactical disagreement <laughs> and all of the massive mountain of feelings that was created by it. But I I'm I'm officially right now. If and honestly, you're the only one who ever brings it up. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. So I'm saying like I never bring it up in other interviews. Other folks don't bring it up. It's long his past history. Okay, and well, I that's don't why I should have been the face of force the vote, Jank. <laughs> <laughs> well, by the way, if that's you why you should have been calling me the vote, face of force would, the vote. No, but if you were the face of it, it would have made a big difference. It would have well, been. I tried. Yeah. I tried. Like, can you, I wrote that current affairs article specifically because I was trying to create a space where the argument was being articulated separate and apart from the online media sphere. Like quite literally, that was my articulated design. I was busy. I had other things to do. I didn't need a paycheck from writing, you know, an article. What I needed was to create some neutral ground where people could read an article and make their own decisions based on an argument and not a personality. And obviously that didn't work, but God damn it, I tried. Yeah. And, and, and Brianna, why am I on here? My campaign's over. There's no reason to be on here other than to go forward, right? Well, so I appreciate from, that. I really do. I, yeah, I really so, do. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I was going to say, for God's sake, not just with me and you, but with the audience. 
yeah, okay, even if you just caught feelings about what I said about Sirota and Grimm, and you think that they're whatever they are, I don't want to recharacterize it, okay? But you have your beef with them for whatever reason, and you have your beef with me for whatever reason. I mean, if you believe the outrageous things, then you're probably not going to work with us. Like, who wants to work with a guy funded by Nancy Pelosi? Okay, fine, right? So, okay, don't, please. Then I don't want to work with you. You don't want to work with me. Great, we agree, right? But for everyone else, for everyone else that, for God's sake, cares about the movement, passing bills, because, guys, whether I win, somebody else wins, somebody was the face, the other person was the face, someone's the leader, the other one's the leader. Who cares? If you don't pass the bills, then we all collectively have done nothing. We must unite. We must unite to try to keep our eyes on the prize, which is to actually pass these bills. So what I'm doing next, Brianna, is I'm taking the kernel of the, the volunteers, et cetera, that I had on my campaign. And I'm starting something called Operation Hope. And I'm going to try to bring it over to TYT. It's in transition, et cetera. And, and if you find it, if you stumble across it at some point and you like what we're doing, great. No one has any obligation. No one, you don't worry. You could hate me and you don't have to do it. And you could be like, bah humbug on hope. I don't want it. Or I don't want it with you. Anything's fine. But if you're, it, say, hey, you know what? It seems like a worthy effort. Maybe if we get together, we can organize the internet and organize our movement and organize young people in a way that could actually help the rest of average Americans. Well, what is it? That would be what beautiful. What is it, Jane? T what is Operation Hope? So what I'm going to do is I I'm going to try to create a central hub where, because our videos and our memes go to a lot of people, go to millions of people and two, 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 great, wonderful, I'm happy about it, but it's not enough. You have to create an amplifier. Part of the reason that I try to get on mainstream media, which is now hopeless, is because they have the amplifier. Whatever they say gets amplified a thousand times over by the rest of media covering it, right? And that's a huge advantage that the establishment has and that the progressive movement doesn't have. So I decided, well, okay, we can't break into that. They've got us, I've got, I'm canceled on all three cable networks and that's now confirmed. Uh, so so instead, we're, I'm going to try to bring it up from social media. Because social media can be an amplifier. So, for example, mm -hmm. I'll throw out one idea, but I want in our town halls and in our slacks, et cetera, for, for all of us to come up with the idea together and to push together and to come up with tactics together. And and by the way, as we do that, there'll be slight hurt feelings. So they didn't do my tactic. They did the other tactic, et cetera. But we can't let that affect us. we got to stay on the same boat. And so one pr potential example is the Ohio ballot measure for higher minimum wage. Nina Turner's in Ohio. Her group is already trying to help with that measure. Ballot measures are direct democracy. It's one of the few places we have left for direct democracy. And that we could all begin to influence the social media and get enough attention to it so that it passes. But I give you that as just one of hundreds of examples that we can come up with together and then act together. Act together online and then act together in the real world. I... I support that endeavor. I feel strongly that a lot can be done with the united uh, left media. We struggle in a way that right independent media doesn't because they are very well funded um, because their interests align with corporate interests. But I think the Bernie campaigns demonstrated that we have a lot more power than we think we do when we do unite. So I look forward to hearing more about that. Quick round robin, Jank, going into the general election, the non-Biden candidates, Jill Stein, Cornell West, RFK Jr. Do you have a fighter? No, I'm going to try to get uh, some or maybe all of those folks on the show and hear them out because uh, I think that they deserve to be heard out. Uh, and if if you made me pick one now, I you know I think Cornell West is kind of an easy one. There's a lot of things I don't agree with RFK Jr. on, and I think, uh, but we have to see if it's. You know, then we might get into tactical disagreements at a later time in the election cycle about whether to support. Well, what about Doctor Doctor Stein? Because because uh, of ballot, if if, if only because of uh, ballot access reasons. Yeah, which Cornell West is look, struggling with. So it gets complicated because I think third parties. If we had an effective third party, it could be a lifesaver. Um, on the other hand, they have not been effective so far. So if at the end. Everybody takes two to three percent from Biden. Now, at this point, I, I dislike Biden so much. It, it's I mean, I. 
it's not a matter of whether I want Biden to win or not. I hate his policy on Gaza. I think I don't think he's a sweet, empathetic man. I think he's monstrous in a lot of ways. But the very worst outcome is Trump winning. And so you have to be strategic in figuring out, you know, which way is that vote going to go at the end? But we're not there yet. We're at the stage right now where we should hear everyone out and see if they can get momentum. Because a third party of all the races, maybe this is the one where they have a shot because the two uh, Democratic and Republican candidates are so, so deeply unpopular. So let's hear them out and then let's all make a tactical and strategic decision as we get closer well, to, to be clear, election. though, both Cornell West and Jill Stein would be third party. So what I was asking about is the choice between the two of them with the it, it seeming increasingly like Jill Stein because of her backing in the Green Party is going to have more presence on more ballots uh, in more states across the country than Dr. West, although it remains to be seen. Yeah, I, I, I'm open to it. I, I agree with most of Jill Stein's positions. So uh, I'm, I'm open to it. I'm not overly hopeful, uh, but. Let's hear it out. Uh, and in terms of between Stein and, and Cornell West, I generally agree with both of them. So I, there's no reason for me to say one is better than the other right now. So let me right, interview them sure. and let's see what we got. All right. Well, look, as things progress, I love to keep this line of communications op open, Jenk. I really do uh, appreciate your perspective on things. I had hoped to get into what happened with the California races a little as someone who has some firsthand expertise there, but we'll have to find another time to chat. And hey, it's not fully corporate media like cable news media, but the door is always open to you on the Hill as well. So let's talk about getting you back on Rising. Sounds good. Thank you, Brianna. And look, la uh, last thing I'll say is, you know, we've had this conversation a bunch of times, and I know that even for the people that are listening or, or viewing it, that it's hard to separate out those feelings. But hear what Brianna and I just said at the end. Please, all of us, to the best of your abilities, Let's get beyond it. Let's go back to unifying and let's try to do something productive because it isn't about us. It's about the average person and the help that they desperately need and that we all have to fight for them on behalf of them to get for them. That's right. That's 100% right. So thank you all for listening. You know where to find Jank Uger over at TYT and beyond. And a very, very, very hearty keep the faith to all of you. Keep the faith to you. Uh, Jank, I really do appreciate that. And you can get more episodes of Bad Faith Podcast, you know, on Mondays at patreon.com slash Bad Faith Podcast. Thank you all. Take care of yourselves. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash Bad Faith Podcast. That's patreon.com slash Bad Faith Podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.